the Buddha once said that the most important external factor in gaining awakening is having admirable friends, or actually engaging in admirable friendship, which is a little bit different from simply having admirable friends. In the ideal admirable friendship, you're actually taking on good qualities from the other friend. The admirable friend is supposed to be a good example in terms of generosity, conviction, discernment, and virtue. It helps clear up your misunderstandings on those topics. But it's admirable friendship when you find yourself growing in those qualities yourself. Because after all, the purpose of an admirable friend is to help you recognize who your admirable friends are inside. Because one of our main problems is that we suffer from delusion. Thoughts come into the mind. And it's hard for us to tell. Is this a good thought or is this a bad thought? Even if part of the mind recognizes that it may be a bad thought, another part says, well, no, maybe it's got its good side after all. After all, there are so many different opinions out there, and our minds have been filled with all the wrong views that come from the media, the wrong views we've picked up from other people. Sometimes even when the other people are giving us right views, we come away with wrong views. I was talking to someone tonight who we've been talking for years. And suddenly discovered he had some pretty bad misunderstandings, which I thought I had cleared up a long time ago. Which just goes to show sometimes you can hear right view many, many times and it doesn't sink in. So you can't blame society for giving you wrong views. It's what you've picked up. And it was your karma that made you pick up those things. I've noticed in my own family. My two brothers and I came away from our childhood being raised by the same parents with, a lot, with very different impressions about what they taught. So what's important as you're engaging in an admirable friendship is that you try to pick up what's really skillful. Once you learn to recognize it, you try to develop it within yourself. The first quality is conviction. I didn't list them in the proper order just now. It's convinced that the Buddha really was awakened. What does that mean? It's not just being convinced of an historical fact. It's thinking about the implications of that, which is that the Buddha was able to find true happiness through his own efforts, through developing qualities in his mind that we have in a potential form in our minds as well. In other words, we have the potential for finding true happiness if we develop the right qualities. So the implication here is that you've got to look at your mind. and develop the qualities that he worked on, resolution, ardency, heedfulness. Heedfulness, he said, is the most important. In some places it's defined as diligence, but it's more than simply just doing the work. It's having a strong sense that your choices make a difference. And this is why conviction in the Buddha's awakening comes down to conviction and karma. That your actions are important, they do make a difference. And you have to be very careful, because it's so easy to choose to do the wrong thing, to choose to do the unskillful thing. So when you see the danger of unskillful actions, and the security that can come from acting in a skillful way, 
that leads to the next quality, which is ardency. And when you really try to act on this principle. Ardency is another name for right effort. You see the unskillful qualities coming up in the mind. You've got to do what you can to undercut them. Now, sometimes that means simply watching them, and sometimes it means that you really have to exert an effort. And in both cases, this requires the third quality, which is resolution. In other words, there's a tendency when a certain unskillful quality comes up that you want to act on it. Anger arises in the mind, and you want to say something or do something to express it. So the first part of resolution is holding firm, not giving in to the sway of that particular defilement. And the other part, too, is if it requires work to undo it, okay, you're willing to do the work. I don't know how many times you hear that all you have to do is just be mindful of your defilements and you're not overcome by them, and that's enough right there. Well, it's not enough, because they could sneak up on you when you're not being vigilant, and you suddenly find yourself doing this, things you knew you shouldn't be doing, and you wonder why. It's because the roots are still in the ground. It's like one of those vines in the orchard. It's not enough simply to cut the vine at the ground level. You've got to dig down into the ground to find the root, to be done with it. Otherwise, it just keeps coming back, coming back, coming back. And you have to spend all your time cutting it back, cutting it back. You're never done with it. So you've got to dig down and see, where is this particular defilement coming from? Many times that means going against your inclinations, going against your old habits. But you've got to be resolute. You've got to be strong. So when we talk about conviction in the Buddha's awakening, these are some of the implications. You've got to develop those same qualities that he said he worked on. It was hatefulness, ardency, resolution in your own mind. The next quality you want to develop from admirable friendship is virtue. If you see that an action is harmful, you just don't do it. Because if you keep on doing these things, they become a, a rut in the mind, and you find yourself falling into the rut again and again and again. And if you're indulging in a particular activity, it's hard to focus in on the, on the cause of that activity. You may tell yourself, well, I'll just watch it as I indulge, and that'll be my mindfulness. Well, no. I mean, the fact that something in the mind said yes to the activity, you've got to figure out why. And the best way to figure that out is to just keep saying no, 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 and see what arguments the mind comes up with, and taking them apart one by one by one. It's in this way that Restraint is an excellent source of knowledge. The other problem, of course, is that if you indulge in certain activities, you tend to give yourself excuses. There's all kinds of good rationalizations for why you do it. And you're not going to see those rationalizations until you say no to them. So the restraint of virtue is an important part of learning to know the mind, to figure out where those unskillful qualities are and why they have control over you. This is why virtue flows from conviction. And in some texts they actually say that 
virtue that's pleasing to the noble ones is actually an aspect of conviction. Another quality that goes with conviction is generosity. You see the things that you have to give up in order to develop skillful qualities in the mind, and you're willing to give them up. The word jaga here means more than just generosity, giving things to other people. It means giving up things. It's kind of like relinquishment. It might be a better translation. If you see that indulging in certain foods has a bad effect on the mind, well, you stop it. Indulging in certain kinds of conversations has a bad effect on the mind, well, you stop it. Indulging in certain thoughts has a bad effect on the mind. You stop it. You give it up. You give it back. Say, These were the pleasures I used to have, but I'm going to give them back. I don't need them because they come with strings attached. They come with, with poison for the mind. And then finally, there's discernment, which in this context is defined as discernment of arising and passing away. What this means is you learn to look into the mind to see exactly how it's creating suffering out of things where it doesn't have to. You can be sitting in a particular situation and suddenly find yourself suffering, and then you find yourself not. The situation didn't change. It was something happened in your mind. And this is the arising and passing that the Buddha is talking about, the arising and passing of mental states. Now, to see this, the mind has to get very, very still. This is why we sit here practicing concentration, to get everything as still as possible, so you can see the slightest fluctuations in the mind, when there's stress present, when there's not. The practice of concentration not only gets you still, so that you can see movements, but also gets you more and more sensitive. You see more and more subtle movements. When you get better and better at this, then you know your mind a lot better. They can start rooting out deeper and deeper roots of suffering. Because as you think, see things rising, passing away, and you see the suffering that comes and the suffering that goes, the next question, of course, is, well, what's, what's causing that? And this is where you have your magic bullet. But it says, regard everything in terms of the Four Noble Truths. Like where there's suffering, you look for the cause. You don't attack the suffering, you attack the cause. You abandon the cause. You simply try to comprehend the suffering. And that can apply to any mental event. You try to bring right view, all the factors of the path, from right view all the way to right concentration, to bear on that particular issue. And it can be clinging, it can be craving, it can be feeling, intention, attention, verbal fabrication, mental fabrication, bodily fabrication, like the breath. When you think about dependent core arising and all the various ways that suffering can, stress can arise in the mind, it's useful to know that whatever the factor that's coming or contributing to that. Just, all you have to do is look at it in terms of the Four Noble Truths, and that brings knowledge to bear where there used to be ignorance. And it's through the abandoning of ignorance that the causes of suffering no longer cause suffering. The suffering goes away. In other words, you learn to breathe with knowledge, you learn to think with knowledge, you learn to label things with knowledge and see what's happening. It's interesting that when the there are questions that the Buddha refused to answer. The question always was, well, why are you not answering this? Is it because you don't know? And the Buddha says, no, I know, I see, but I don't answer. And what it comes down to is that he knew and saw where those questions came from. He looked at those mental events in terms of the Four Noble Truths and saw that this particular question is 
bound to bring suffering no matter how you answer it. That's the kind of knowledge that he's looking for. That's the kind of knowledge he's recommending. So whatever comes up in the mind, you try to look at it in those terms. So that regardless of how complex dependent core rising might be, it's just this series of questions, this series of duties that goes along with these questions. Where is the suffering? How do you comprehend it? Where is the cause? How do you abandon it? How do you develop the factors of the path so that you can realize awakening? This is why the Buddha said that it was through having him as an admirable friend that the monks developed the Eightfold Path. In other words, they developed the qualities in mind, conviction, virtue, relinquishment, discernment. that allow them to bring suffering to an end. So that's what it means to have admirable friendship. It's not simply hanging around good people, but it's picking up the qualities these particular qualities and developing them in your own mind. So sitting in meditation is actually an expression of admirable friendship. Any aspect of the path is an aspect of admirable friendship. You're not attributing all the good to the admirable friend. You're taking responsibility to detect what's admirable in that friend, what's worth taking as an example, and then actually developing it within yourself. This, of course, requires that you use your own discernment, because you can't expect the admirable friend to be a good example in everything. You can't throw all the responsibility on the friend. The whole point of admirable friendship is you learn how to take responsibility for yourself. That's the way in which this factor helps to lead to awakening.